Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I am from the University of Minnesota, but I'm over at Rochester. Uh, we have been, uh, we are there at a regional office, and actually I've been in extension for a long time. And the last 20 years about, we've been uh, working in Rochester. My coworker, uh, Fritz Breitenbach, and I have had an opportunity to do many, many herbicide trials. It's been a big part of our work, but we also do a lot with uh, insects, soybean aphids, some corn rootworm. We've done a lot of disease work. We've done seed treatments. Um, so we've had opportunities to evaluate a lot of, um, you know, m many different products, both new products that might be coming on the market, products and systems that are currently there. Um, our job is really more of the applied side, you know, what we can maybe uh, put on the farm and use right away um, and try and answer questions that, that you have. So that's, that's kind of the neat thing. We've had a lot of years, we get to do a lot of applied work, and our idea with our, our job with extension, of course, is get that information out to you, listen to what your concerns are, and try and implement or maybe change some things for the next year. Again, always trying to address the questions that you might have. Um, the last few years, of course, we've done just many, many trials with weeds, and we know the issues with weeds are um, growing, you know, we have, um, whether you're in a conventional system, you're in what we call a traditional system, you're in an organic system, it doesn't really matter. I mean, weeds are still a challenge. And with any of those systems, you can develop resistant weeds. You know, we, uh, the news and the media, we talk a lot about glyphosate resistance. But it is certainly not just glyphosate resistance. We have resistance to other herbicides as well. Um, so we have other methods and things that we talk about. But the whole idea is building systems, building good foundations for weed control. Yes? Can you lift the mic up a little bit? It's pretty quiet out here. Well, you know, thank you, because it, to me, I'm very loud right now. Okay. So I'm hearing a very loud voice. Yes. So if you're we, we in. Can hear you, but that helps a little okay. Bit. Tell me where to. Thank you. I don't mind. Just and remind me, because it's, it's feeding back in my ears right now. So I will do that. I will do that. All right, the first thing I have, um, I've got a handout for you. It doesn't have every single slide in because some of them are pictures, um, but you have the basic information in that handout. I've got some more in the back, so if people do come in, they can just grab it. What I want to really focus or tell you about is we do have a lot of these resources. As I said, Fritz and I have done a lot of trials. Um, we do a lot of work, and you know we post that information, as do our counterparts at the Research and Outreach Center in Waseca. Um, in Lamberton, so we have our site, our crop site um, at the University of Minnesota. When you go there, you get into agriculture, you get specifically into weeds. We have an applied weed side where a lot of our reports are. So if you wanna go back and look for herbicide trials, weed control trials, and how some of these products perform, this is a good site. We've got our reports from Rochester, so right in your backyard, that's just an example of some of the titles. These are good places to get information. We have a lot of videos on weed control, weed management. Um, but then again, there are also our neighboring states have some very good guides on pest management. So Wisconsin has a really good guide, North Dakota has a really good guide, um, and other, again, neighboring states have some very good guides, complete booklets to go in and look for performance on additional weeds. The main weeds that we have in Rochester, giant ragweed, lamb's quarters, water hemp, we have some of the grasses, but those are the three big ones that we work with. And we know as we move into different systems, we might see other weeds like maybe nightshade in some of our places. When we go into more conventional, we start to see more grasses showing up, like woolly cup grass, uh, maybe some crabgrass, some wild prozo millet. So we have some shifts, some other weeds that might be problems for you. We don't have all of those in Rochester, but we've had experience over the years with them but it's nice to go back to some of our other neighbors and look at some of their trials because they maybe have a few different weed species and a little different spectrum to evaluate. So those are the sites that you can go to and you're certainly welcome to contact Fritz or me um, if you have questions on things as well. All right, so taking control of our weeds in corn and soybeans as we look at this. The first big thing, again, knowing which weeds you have, that's just standard, identify them, but we really have to understand more about the biology again. How do these weeds grow? Are they early emerging? Do they emerge over a long period of time? Are they late? Are they season long? So what weeds do we have? What's the biology? What are we doing with them? When do they emerge? When do they set seed? Because that question comes up, it's like, 
when is there viable seed on these weeds? And the reason that becomes important is you're thinking, I might still be able to get out there and do something ahead of those weeds going to seed. How long do they retain the seed? Again, paying attention to how we might harvest them. With any system, doesn't matter, we have to start with a very solid foundation. A pre has to be part of our crops. We also need to be thinking about non-chemical options. And we have some work that we've been doing with that, you know, whether it's delayed planting, can that be effective? Cultivation, still an opportunity there. Can we go in and till? Can we do some spring tillage now again with taking out those small weeds? What about even walking some of those fields? So we know all of those become part of the, part of the options that we need to look at. Okay. Again, our major weeds I mentioned, um, but it really hasn't changed. Foxtails are still a big issue. They can be. Lamb's quarters, water hemp, giant ray weed. These are farmers across southern Minnesota that have answered this question over time and said, hey, these are our big weeds. The main ones, I think the one that wasn't mentioned as a high is um, like nightshade. We talk about mapping our weeds. Again, as we have done our pesticide training across uh, southern Minnesota, we've been asking farmers every year a number of questions. And here was their response. We probably had, you know, five, you know, about 10,000 responses to the, these questions. And only about a half to maybe back in the mid-2000, you can see 2003 to 2006, you know, we had about 70%, 75% of farmers, yeah, I map weeds, I pay attention to what's there, really has dropped off when you come 10 years forward. So about half the farmers are mapping. We think this is still a good tool to go back. So, you know, again, what weeds do I have? Where are they? How can I target? Because anytime you're gonna use a herbicide or any kind of weed management, you're putting an investment out there again. You gotta spend some money. So what and where should we be placing those resources? Weed emergence, okay, we're gonna identify them, we're gonna know where they're at. Understanding a little bit of that biology can really help you as well. We know giant ragweed is an early season emerger. It doesn't have a very extended window. It starts in late April, goes into early June, but that's really its time. So can we change a bit with our planting date, with our tillage, to maybe take out those first flushes with tillage instead of having to rely wholly on on our herbicide. Lamb's quarter spreads in right behind it. I've got, uh, here we go, oh, there we go. If we go to the middle group, we see cockleburr coming in there, woolly cupgrass, our foxtails, you know, quite a list in here, so a lot of our grass is kind of in that May, that's their prime time. But then we have these tail, these later ones, large crabgrass extends into the season, nightshade can extend into the season, water hemp we know can go all summer long, and if our canopy on those soybeans isn't closed, these weeds will take advantage of that and continue to germinate and be a problem for you. So the key, corn, soybeans, a good, solid foundation. When we move away from using glyphosate in our system, we've relied on, again, a very good herbicide, but it has been a big workhorse, not only for broadleaf weeds, but our grasses. So when we take that out of the system, you know, we have to rethink how are we gonna build a good foundation not only for those troublesome broadleaf weeds, but we need a real solid grass program going in early as well. So with corn and beans, thinking about that solid foundation. We need a pre-emergence herbicide that's going to address those major weeds that you have on your farm. What are the key problems and why? Because what that pre-emergence does, it may not take out everything. It may not be perfect and get a completely clean seed bed, but it does help take down the density of the weeds. It might completely control several species, so now you don't have to worry about that. It kind of resets the clock, so your post programs, whatever it might be, you've got more uniform size, you get your timing down better, and again, it just improves that post-emergence program. Even with tillage, if you get a good solid pre down there and you're coming back with cultivation, definitely takes down, you know, a, the density is huge, and again, making for a good program that will last season long. And I'll show you a few slides of that as we go through here. And probably the, another key one that we don't give enough credit to is just simply the window of opportunity. When you put down a robust pre, you widen that time frame to get the job done. It may add a week, 
It may add two weeks. In some cases, we can add even three weeks or more just by having a pre that, again, opens that window. And if rain comes, you still have a chance to get those weeds controlled before they get too big and out of hand, and then there's nothing to do. These are some slides from our uh, trials um, that I'm going to be sharing with you. And just kind of looking, OK, if you look at this one, this is on May 23rd, coming about seven, eight days later here. We're looking at a robust pre down in this corn. We've got a kind of an average one that we've got a bunch of ragweed coming through here, and this is without the pre. Remember, these photos were all taken on the same day. Okay, that's the difference. No pre, a very robust pre, and this one actually already had its post-emergence program on because we had ragweed showing through here. So which one would you prefer in your corn? And if we jump ahead to soybeans, I mean, it's not going to look any different, but a very robust pre. This is only three days later. Can you believe that? That's three days. Ragweed in the same plot, right here, same plot, 23. Again, when giant ragweed starts to take off, just like you see corn taking off, all of a sudden it goes into this rapid growth. Boy, three days. What a window to miss. This is the plot that actually was sprayed. We rate it, we take photos, that, that was treated on that day with a, a burner because we can see some weed control or as far as the weed starting to die there. But you need to be out there. If you have a very robust pre, your window is wider, you've got more time. If you have one that's okay, but maybe left some weeds, you just need to get out there sooner. But if you miss the pre, you needed to be out here ahead of that. We need to go up even further. So good foundations in corn. We'll start on the corn side. We have a number of them, and most of these are combinations of herbicides, but you've probably heard like Acuron, Acuron Flexi is simply Acuron without the atrazine. We've got Resicor, another good one. Those are three very, very strong foundations for corn that bring in multiple uh, sites of action as far as their a herbicide activity. Uh, if you're in Iowa, Corvus becomes an option for you. Again, pretty strong, but this is the tick down from giant ragweed. So we've got mid-90s performance. We've got some 80s to mid-80s with Corvus and Verdict, and this is with the high rates of Verdict. So we're looking at 16 to 18 ounces in corn. And then Instigate and Sure Start in the mid-70s. So we would need to, if you choose to use those, you really need to be in there sooner to get a post-program done. Give you an idea of where the yield goes with this if you don't get those weeds controlled. Again, here's the three at 95% giant ragweed control, 174 bushel. Corvus and Verdict coming in in the mid-80s, about 116. And then Instigate and Sure Start 70%, 75% control, 84 bushel. All right. Gives you an idea of what competition does. This is no post-emergence program, just showing what these can do. If you get delayed and you miss your windows to take out the weeds that are coming, that's the kind of competition we can see. That's 60 bushels. Very strong. Not much needs to be done afterwards. Middle of the road. All that tells us is, hey, we need to have our post-program planned and ready to go. Doesn't mean they aren't a good fit because they're part of, again, mixing things up. So maybe one year where you don't have many weeds or your pressure is not very high, or if giant ragweed isn't your driver weed, you know, again, they're very good on the other small seeded broadleaves like lamb's quarters and water hemp. So, I mean, they do have their place, but if ragweed's a problem, you know, we need some of the heavy hitters here. Or we need to make sure that we're watching that so that we get our post programs on quickly. And in here, we need to even do so sooner yet. So that's that window of time that you have to be paying attention to. Here's what they look like, because I think people can appreciate it more when you start to see <clears throat> how these perform or what they look like. I kind of picked early in the season photos. We've got May 31st and June 13th are most of the, the slides that we'll see, but 98% control of ragweed, 99% control of the other weeds. This is Acuron. Um, the rate is a difference because of our soil types. Okay, so there's where you see a difference there. Uh, so, but again, excellent weed control, 
hanging on for a long period of time and you know, without doing anything else, no post-program, that's where we still had 98, 95% control at the end of the season. Acuron Flexi, if you take the atrazine out, is still a very good program. You see very little difference between the two on the weed spectrum that we have at Rochester. So again, performing very well. You might find one or two in there, but again, it's very, very good, and they're coming in under that canopy. Another option, you can split these programs. It can be a pre-down followed by a post of either of those. So you can have Acuron Flexi down as a pre following as a post. That is an option as well. Again, 99% control of your weeds. Um, a very clean program. It allows you that opportunity to come back if you see, again, something that might be escaping. But either way, we saw very, very, um, very good control. And we've been evaluating these now for about three years at Rochester. Uh, Resicor, again, very good option here. Um, again, three herbicides here. Uh, I didn't even mention that, but you've got the, um, I'm going to back up here. Um, we talk about the sites of action as to what's in these programs, but Resicor, we've got the 415 and the 27. Again, mixing it up, you've got three different modes of action going on with, against our weeds. Again, very good weed control of ragweed and our other weeds. Still clean on June 13th, and the corn is taking off. So Resicor, um, as I said, Acron, Acron Flexi, those are the strong hitters in our corn these days. This too can be as a split program, so that becomes an option. Now you look and you say, well, that's glyphosate in there. Well, in the protocol that we did, in our weed management, that was part of the protocol. I think what glyphosate brought to the program was not very much. There really wasn't anything to do. Why it's in there for a person that can use that is, you know, if there were some grasses that were sneaking through, if there were anything, you know, any, that would help you there, but honestly, as we said, with this kind of weed control, it wasn't needed. You had a very, very good program without the, without the uh, glyphosate in there. Here's Corvus. Again, if you're in Iowa, we can be using that. Um, it is, a, again, very good on the early side. It does start to drift off on its giant ragweed, so if that's a player, you would just need to plan for that in your post program. Sure start, a little weaker. Again, sure start when you compare it to the Resicor. Resicor having some of the, because we talk about the higher rates in that combination, sure start is kind of the low rate of three products. So it's a lower end rate, and we do start to see, you know, here it is on June 13th, a lot more ragweed and other weeds starting to pop through, 75%. Again, it just tells me that I need to get out there sooner than if I had on some of the other programs so it's just a choice. And if ragweed's not your big player, um, this may work out really well for you. Uh, here's another option is, you know, Sure Start followed by Resicor. Again, we look at some of the costs of these. Um, we know that some of these programs can be very spendy. We understand that. But when you lose 60 bushels with some of these weeds, um, you do, you know, it's worth that investment. So plan it. You know, as you're putting your plans together, which fields have the very, you know, the worst problems? Where do you have the densities that really need those strong foundations compared to others? So again, it does take some time. It's going to take some effort to lay out programs. But with corn, we have many options that don't include, don't need to have that additional glyphosate. So we do have some very good herbicide programs in corn that are, you know, conventional conventional and more work um, very well on the weed spectrum we have. Verdict, again, it is a good player, but it runs out. So again, it's a good start, uh, but it does run out sooner than some of our others. As you can see, again, we've got some ragweed coming through, and it's simply, it's a pre-emergence program, but as we get into the season, we do need to follow up with our post-emergence program. Uh, instigate a weaker player, and you can just see that. Again, here gives you an example. June 7th, I mean, so we're already having a lot of breakthroughs on that. So not as not as strong a player when giant ragweed's in the mix. Very good on the other weeds, but not giant ragweed. Okay, one reminder, you know, as we move into the conventional systems, you're probably well aware, but think about this with our interactions. We haven't had to talk about this for a while because if you've got BT, you know, been using the BT corns or as you're rotating, uh, corn soybean, you know, that's still a very good way to manage our corn rootworm. We know that. If you're rotating um, in different crops, 
We're probably not using the insecticides, but if we are, don't forget that there are some interactions, especially with the organophosphates here, and counter is the big player, has that higher risk. So make sure that you're paying attention to which herbicide program you use if you are indeed uh, putting down an insecticide, because there can be some issues. We usually think of the ALS materials, which would be like the Instigate, for example, but there sometimes are interactions with some of our others, like the HPPDs or the PPOs. So I mean, again, checking those labels becomes very, very important at this point. So now that we've got a strong pre, we're coming back with our post program. Think about some of those options. Um, of course, you know, tillage might be part of your program. Still a good option. Uh, Fritz and I talk about this a lot. We say, you know, folks in, the past few years, anytime we bring up tillage or other options, we usually get laughed at because, we go, no, I'm not going to pull out my cultivator. We're not getting laughed at so much anymore because we're realizing with some of these weed problems, we've got to come up with something other than a herbicide choice, and tillage still becomes a good option. It still should be in your back pocket when we go with our pre emergence products because if we go to a dry spring, and we're not getting the activation the way we want with some of our herbicides. This is where that light cultivation, using that spring tooth harrow, um, coming back and just gently mixing the soil does a couple of things. It helps activate that herbicide, but it also can take out any flush that may be missed. Okay, so if there's a flush, we talk about that white weed stage. You know, if we have some weeds breaking through that the herbicide didn't control yet, that, that flush of tillage or that coming across with some light tillage to activate the herbicide and take out the flushes can be very beneficial. So it should be, again, in that back pocket as an option that you could, could potentially use. When we go to the herbicide groups, you know, we've got broadleaves, we've got a number of choices here. Most of them are the growth regulators, and some of our callistal lotus are the 27s. If we have grasses coming through, this is going to be the challenge in corn. If we haven't laid down a good foundation, coming back post-emergence to clean up grasses is difficult. We don't have as many options. We do know that Resicor compared to the Acuron is actually a bit better. So that is a little better on some of these grasses. If you have Woolly Cup, Wild Prozo, you know, that's just, again, some of the early ratings on that. Um, the Lotus, better Accent Q would be another option, but you have to watch your stage that you're getting that application need to go early. Um, adding atrazine can be synergistic um, to help. Or again, do you have tillage in that plan that you could come back with? So again, we have to spend a lot more time paying attention to which weeds are out there, how big they are, before we can lay out just a kind of that recipe. Because every recipe is going to be a bit different as we move into other weed species showing up. And in corn, the grasses will be the next challenge. Okay, as we go into what the good pre does in soybeans, uh, the big thing is, again, taking out those first flushes of weeds. These are some of our heavy hitters in soybeans, or you can see the, the difference, I should say. Authority first, Sigua Pro, Rowell is Valor, here's Verdict in Beans, and Boundary. And what I put up here is just to, again, show you that window of time. So the blue bar up on top, that's the percent control of our ragweed. So we go from 80, high 80s, down to boundary, basically none. I mean, 20 is basically none. The red numbers here from 43, 34, that's the days after planting that we put on our post program. So with authority first, having very good giant ragweed, as well as our other small seeded broad leaves and grass control doing a very nice job, a very clean uh, plots in there. From planting, we had 43 days. So we did not have to make those applications until the latter part of June at a very wide window. Zidua Pro, about 34 days, so you can see that time difference, about nine days. Valor, 26, and then all the way down to 23. So even if a pre isn't very, you know, if it's, if it's not as robust, it does give you something because Boundary is very good on water hemp, very good on lambs quarters. We get some grass control in there. So it does give you some time, but again, if giant ragweed's your driver, boy, you need to be out there very soon. But if it's not, your window just widened up again. So which weeds do you have? That will, again, depend, widen that window for you. If ragweed's not there, you have a wider window. If it is, 
You better be out there quickly or you better choose something up in this area where you're getting uh, more control. And those aren't the only ones. Um, prefix is a very good one down for a pre-emergent herbicide, but it can also be used post-emergent. You have to make a choice which way do you want to go because it does have um, the flex star in there. So we need to decide, are we going as a pre or post? But it's an excellent pre-emergence. It looks very good. It's very good control of a broad spectrum of weeds. Okay, when we go into surveil, which is, was gangster before, is a first rate and valor combination. It too is one of our best performers. Um, 95 to 99% control, again, gives you the widest window with those two products. Okay, authority first is very good. Where we're starting to see challenges is where we have resistance. We have some giant ragweed populations that are resistant to ALS. And where we see in the past 90% control, we're now dripping down into maybe 60, 50, 40. So if you don't have ALS resistant, this is still a very good player in our soybeans as far as um, uh, controlling many of our weeds. But if you have resistance, that's gonna change the dynamics a bit and we have to be planning for that. We have about, um, we have multiple rates depending on your soil types. Um, we are now recommending those higher rates. In the past, we've done a lot with four, four and a half, but we think now the 6.4 and the eight ounces, again, getting that good foundation is so important with those robust herbicides. So the higher rates going down pre to carry you longer into the season. Uh, fierce with first rate, again, fierce can be a little fierce on the beans coming out of the ground. We kind of joke about that, but any of your PPOs, um, even gangster, we can see the valor. We can see a little bit of puckering, a little bit of struggle coming out. That's why those labels say plant and get them on three days. You got three days. You need them on very fast. You can still see a little bit of, uh, again, puckering here, but weed control is good. They grow out of it. It's just something that we have to get accustomed to seeing, a little bit of injury sometime, but very clean. Adding that first rate really helps us with that giant ragweed, but excellent control on our other weeds. Authority Assist adds the pursuit in there. Not as good on the ragweed, but if you have um, uh, nightshade as an issue, again, throwing in the assist there with the pursuit can be very good on the nightshade. Again, but we have to think, if, if giant ragweed's in that system, that would not be my first choice. Uh, Zidua Pro, again, is replacing Octil Pro. So again, having three products in there. Um, it's, it's very good on our other weeds. We've got a weak hole with giant ragweed. So again, not my first choice if giant ragweed is there, but certainly a very good product on the small seeded. So it, again, depending on which weeds you have, um, maybe some of the choices that we make. A verdict at five ounces just runs out too soon. It's okay on some of our weeds, but it does run out. It does help to maybe add the, we talk a lot about metribuzin, which is Sencor, Tricor, helps a little bit. But again, 50% control on the ragweed, very good on the other weeds. So depending on which weeds you have, could be an option. This just shows you kind of that follow-up. You know, here's the verdict outlook Tricor, kind of quite a mix going down pre, still having ragweed coming through, coming back with Cobra, having to burn those weeds. And what we know when we burn is we open up that canopy and we still can get some other emerging because we don't have, you know, we have to think about the verdict might run out, the outlook's gonna carry us for a while, but there are some systems. We do have some systems with beans, but we still need that very solid foundation on it. Here's the boundary again. Very good on the small seeded, very weak. You can see a lot, whoops, a lot of, of the uh, giant ragweed coming through. I need it quick. All right. Okay. I want to show you one of the trials. Um, I maybe shared this last year, but we repeated it again this year. And basically the same story. It worked very well. And this is a, a way to manage water hemp. And it's even more of an issue or concern because we have resistance as a growing problem. Not just resistant to glyphosate, but we have water hemp. A lot of it was resistant to the ALS materials, especially pursuit, um, even before glyphosate hit the ground. So we've got resistance to the ALS. We've got resistance to glyphosate, but more recently now this year, many more sites that were resistant to the PPOs, which would be um, the Flexstar, the Cobra, the Valor. 
Uh, and we think of Valor as a pre, uh, still being pretty effective on it. But our post-emergence programs, like the Flexstar Cobra, the burners going out, we are getting positive resistance to that. So that's a challenge, because that is one of the tools you could use. But if resistance is showing up, boy, we've really knocked out a few of our um, players there. So here's what we've tried is a couple of things. One of them is how about layering our, what we call our 15. So this is the dual outlook. Zidual would be in there. Um, warrants would fall in there. So we've got our, what we call our 15s, the site of action 15, or group 15. And it's just a layering process. They go down as part of your pre-emergence program. And about 30 days after planting, you come back with a second application because all of these can go down as a post as well. They could go on by themselves, but we would suggest, you know, if you have other weeds, you certainly need to be putting something else with. And you can tank mix these with some of the products. Um, again, got to go back, look at herbicide, look at the labels, make sure they can all go together. But definitely these can go as a post, come on as a layered effect. Works very, very well. And the whole idea is that, you know, when you put your pre-emergence herbicide down, it's going to start to break down in the soil. And water hemp here, it emerges over a very long window. And what, what tends to happen is about 30 days after, we start to get down to a point where there's not enough concentration in the soil anymore to control the, the water hemp and it starts to break through. So we start to drip down here. Well, if we layer, then we add additional about 30 days. We add additional, so again, we pump that up. So hopefully we're sitting with this concentration in the soil to again, control the water hemp that's emerging later in the season. And again, we've got our second year and it's pretty much just a mirror image of what happened last year, but we added a few additional um, treatments to kind of tease out a few more uh, pieces of information that, that farmers were asking. So if we look at the, um, the concept here is, here's your pre, so your pre-emergence, this is the weed control, water hemp control. So we start out with everything, the pre going down, 98% starting to drip. Here's about our 30 day window right here down to 90, 78, and by the end of the season, 76. Still give us control, but we have escapes in there. If we layer with another, so we put the 15 and then we add additional, we'll just say dual plus more dual, outlook plus more outlook. Now we change into this bar. So we're staying right here. We add our layered treatment right in here, about 30 days after planting, and we maintain control through the rest of the season. We close up our soybean canopy, and we keep our control all the way in the upper 90s or mid 90s. Another layered approach that folks asked us about is what if we put Valor down and came back with Outlook, Warrant, Zidua, Dual. So here's where we put the 14 down, we layered it 30 days after, and we stayed again very good. Valor is very good on water hemp. We have very good control. Again, we're concerned about the PPO resistance that's sneaking in, but that would be another good option too. So putting the 14 followed by a 15 30 days after planting. Question was, why 30 days? Well, all of these 15s, that's about how long that half-like, or as the, the herbicide is kind of breaking down that, this one, you know, 30 days is about this point here where it starts to wear out and you don't have enough concentration in the soil. So that's, Kind of a good, a good guide. Um, would you go earlier or later? Well, we tried that, we did that, and it tends to be, a, it's better if you get it on a little earlier than later, but it also would be, what other herbicides did I put in my pre-program? That might still give you that, that later window. So, good questions on that, but we're kind of targeting that 30 days after as far as when to layer in. If you look at uh, grouping these together, the layers were on average about 50 bushel, pre only about 42, um, so about eight bushel average by adding the layer and controlling those weeds, but the range was all the way up to 14 to 18 bushel. The group 15, 14, again, so an effective way. And here's what it looks like. So here's your pre only with all the water hemp coming through. This is where you layer. And what you've done is you've taken out those weeds and your canopy is closing, so now it's very difficult for any of those weeds to come through anymore. It kind of puts it on stop. So the layering even shows it very well. 
Again, just later in the season, you can see those weeds continuing and where the outlook is very clean. Okay, uh, volunteer corn, I bring this up because you know that too is an issue. It doesn't matter how we are managing as far as our uh, type of beans we're growing. I mean, it is a weed, it is a host for corn rootworm. Our goal should still be to take it out by mid-June or about V5, depending on when you planted those beans, but usually mid-June, that would kind of lay into that same time to layer. So an option might be to come back with a post plus an outlook, because post has no residual, but it will take out your volunteer corn and then add that outlook in there to, again, carry you with some water hemp issues. As far as post emergence, tillage can still be an option. We have a lot of group 14s that can come back post, uh, but they're gonna burn those beans and open the canopy up. That's not always a good thing. We've got a few of our group twos. Again, depending on what you did in your pre-program, could be an option. We definitely want to, um, again, control our volunteer corn, or if we have other grass, we've got options there. But here might be some of those to add into the post program to layer up to take care of any water hemp that might be sneaking through. Um, we've got our other options as far as tillage goes, which, again, let's, we do need to consider those. And one of the treatments that we did this past uh, couple of years was to put boundary down and then at a higher rate and then come back. Um, we were at June 29th. We tilled this on the 24th with one cultivation. So you can see how it looks. Came into here on the 22nd. We put a cultivator through it on the 24th. This is what it looked like at the end of June. Um, 57 bushel, it was in our top yielding group. So definitely can work. And what we noticed here is this canopy closed faster. The beans took a jump. They really did, again, close off that canopy and control any weeds underneath. Here's our, in 2016, again, repeating that same, we tilled on the 21st. Again, we were up in the, um, I'm gonna continue, one more. So there's where it looks like when we came back in and tilled on the 21st, 58 bushels. So again, in the high yielding group. So just a good solid pre-down and coming back with one pass of cultivation uh, towards the end of June very effective treatment here, controlling our weeds. Okay, I'm gonna go. All right, just a couple more points here, and then I have to, I'm checking my time because I know where I need to be, but I did wanna highlight a few other options and why it's so important. We have to think about managing that weed. Again, what do we do? What else can we do besides herbicides? What are some other options? Well, one of the things that a grad student, uh, Jared Goplin, was working on giant ragweed that was both glyphosate resistant and ALS resistant, and trying to look for systems to manage that ragweed. And the thing with that weed is that if you maintain it zero weed, or if you don't let it go to seed, you can really deplete that seed bank in two years. Now I probably, if I was mentioned this last year, but I wanna bring it back because there's some, just some good visuals as to how this can work. So a goal, keep those big plants from going to seed, get rid of them. Giant ragweed sets its seed in late August, so you've got kind of a window. If you've got some escapes out there, there's an opportunity, that's where the hole comes in. Going back there with some tillage, hoeing them out, cleaning them up, because if we prevent that weed from going to seed, in two years, you know, we've really depleted that seed bank. So we can take giant ragweed out of our, pro out of our farm or out of those fields, but we have to be very diligent on it. Rotation helps when we add Alfalfa and wheat, if that's part of our system, it really does because again, just a different crop in that system besides corn and soybeans helps reduce that seed bank. Timing, which I'm gonna show you the planting and the tillage, delaying planting a bit, adding tillage. Again, you can really reduce that because most of the ragweed has emerged by early June. So if we take out those first flushes with tillage, and again, it starts to set its seeds in August, but it hangs on to its seed well into October. So how can we maybe, again, manage those hot spots, map those weeds, get them out of there before they replant themselves on your farm? So here it just again shows most of that giant ragweed emerging by the end of May. If we would delay our soybean planting, do tillage to take out the flush, 
Now we're only trying to manage about 25% of that weed population rather than all of it. And I think this, these pictures show it the best. Okay, this is at Waseca with a May 5th planting. Okay, these pictures are taken in mid-June. So May 5th, it's a weedy check, so if you just let all of the weeds come through, do no herbicide, there's where you're sitting. If you would delay just to May 10th, okay, May 10th, you notice that difference. There's May 5th planting five days later. Okay, you still have a lot of giant ragweed there, but it's not quite as dense. If we go out to May 19th, so nine days later, plant May 19th, You've taken out a flush of that ragweed. Again, you still have ragweed there, but it's not near as robust. Now you're managing a much lower density. You've got a chance. But this is probably, what, wait till May 30th. If you can afford to do that, we think about, oh, maybe not that late, but maybe May 20th, maybe May 22nd, maybe somewhere in there. That's the difference. So nothing else is done here. This is just delaying the planting and what you do to change that giant ragweed population. Now you could come in with your pre, you could still use a pre-emergence, you can still plan your program working towards how I'm gonna manage my water hemp. You can still think about the layered program, but you've really changed the density of your ragweed. The other option is what herbicide goes down. If you've got a more robust pre, like Sonic, which is very good on ragweed, planting May 5th, but again, if you delayed the planting, you don't have the ragweed to deal with. If you use something like Boundary, which is horrible on giant ragweed, you got an issue. I mean, there, there you really have a problem. But if you were to delay the planting May 30th and use Boundary, which is very good on your water hemp and your small seeded broadleaves, manipulating it with planting date and tillage, again, opens up a few more options for you. This could work. So again, there are systems, and I, I know I can't tell you every story here this morning as to what could work, but there are systems that can, and I think the point is we have to be thinking. We have to be thinking, planning. That's what winter's here for. We've got to think about it, plan, use our resources. Now I'm going to just jump really fast because resistant isn't just for the folks that are using glyphosate. We have resistant weeds for everybody. And we have resistance not just to glyphosate, but we have ALS resistance, PPO, we have HPPD. We have all kinds of growth regulators. We have a lot of resistance issues. And so my main point is those weeds are moving. We have overland flooding that moved those seeds. We have machines that are moving. Just realize that resistance could be on your farm too, could be in the fence rows. We have multiple resistance. You know, this is Flexstar resist, this is the PPO where they're coming back. You know, lots of resistance, doesn't matter. Okay, so, so, yep. Go back to that. Oh, Two slides back. sorry. I thought you wanted me off, so that's no, why I was I hurrying up. <laughs> I think you've got a little more time than we said. So okay, we'll okay. So I just wanted to point out that, can you talk about that ALS resistance, ragweed specifically? I'm wondering how many farmers actually might have that on their farm. ALS yeah. Um, okay, here's, here is my experience with the, the um, ALS resistant, it, with the giant ragweed. Um, you know, not really realizing that it is, and if you've used the ALS materials, I mean, you think of your historic, you know, how much have you used the ALS materials, like the Authority First in soybeans, for example. And on the farm that we were doing the work with Giant Ragweed, with Jared Goplin, we didn't know it was resistant. We didn't, you know, that wasn't, we went in thinking a glyphosate resistant Giant Ragweed population, that's what we had. And it was in that first season that we realized we've got another problem here. And as we talked to the farmer and knew what his history was, the light bulbs were going on. But here's what we saw. We're normally authority first, sonic, same material, should give us that 90 plus percent control right out of the bag. I mean, you shouldn't see giant ragweed coming through. When we were raiding those plots, we go, We've got all this ragweed coming through. And so you go back and you look at what you do and you think and you scratch your head and you're asking and says, we got a problem out here. And truly, it was more like 40% control than 90% control. And it was just one of those obvious scratch your head going like, we don't own, you know, all of a sudden. Then we did some testing of it and, and sure, it was, it was ALS resistant as well. So when you start to see, you know, your programs that you think should be strong, 
good, solid foundations not working anymore, and you think about your history, if you haven't been mixing things up, I mean, you basically selected for it. That population is out there. So you see performance going down. It isn't always like that giant ragweed that goes completely dead and, and then takes off again. It just may be a subtle that I thought I was going to have 90% control and I have 40% control. I have a lot of those weeds blowing through. So a little detective work. What we kind of think about now is just assume that you could have resistance and that you have it on your farm. Make that assumption on the front end and build your programs accordingly. So the whole goal is to mix it up as much as you can. And what you can be adding to your farm, which I think others do too, is we need to think of tillage. We need to think of that delayed planting. You know, take my fields that are the biggest challenge and use some of those strategies. We need to think, what else can I do? Does it have to be two years of corn, perhaps, because we have more options in corn? Um, so we, you know, it's like, yeah. And the resistance, definitely, the ALS materials blow through. And on our water hemp site, we say most of the water hemp in Minnesota is ALS resistant as well, because we were using pursuit on these fields before glyphosate was even introduced. So it has been exposed to the ALS materials. And the trial that we are doing that water hemp work, we've actually used pursuit and first rate on, we get no control. You know, it just blows right through it. You know, it's a weedy check that yielded eight bushels. I mean, so there's a lot, of, right, a lot of water hemp in it. So the failures are there. So that's where a map like this says, it isn't just glyphosate. Yes, glyphosate has, you know, it's growing in the weeds that are resistant to it. Our concern with glyphosate is when our grasses start popping through. We've got to, there are grasses resistant to glyphosate as well, and there will be more. Australia is dealing with a lot more. Um, but right now, we still are pretty effective against it. But the point is, with this map is really, I mean, all of these herbicide families that we use, we have resistance, and that bar isn't down here anymore. Here's 2015. That, here's our ALS. That's the one that's growing the, very rapidly, very steep. Here's your glyphosate group. You know, we talk about the growth regulators coming on board. We're using growth regulators in corn and wheat and small grains, I mean, we're using them already, so the weeds have been exposed. We use a lot of it in our road ditches, pastures. I mean, so the weeds have seen our growth regulators. We're adding it to beans, so again, across the area. But we already have resistance. And we can develop resistance fairly fast to it, maybe in three or four generations, so it's a concern. All these others, we have HPPDs, the Callistos, the lots. We have resistance to those too. So weeds can develop resistance to most things. Our 15s probably are the ones that we don't have as much, but I'm talking layering with 15s, using more 15s. Yeah, does it bother me? Yeah. But I don't know what else to use other than tillage, rotation, because we're starting to take away some of our, our big players. If ALS doesn't work, if PPO isn't working, if glyphosate's not working, liberty. But we're not in liberty system today. We're not talking about that. So that's where the 15s come in. That's where tillage comes in. All right. Where I was going to jump again, those populations, you know, the biotypes are there. If we become predictable, the weeds get that, they become very much the drivers because they will, again, select. We're selecting for it. So our goal is to be as unpredictable as possible and to keep adding things to it. Use the guides. We have lots of good guides. Look at your labels. Here's where your groups are. You need to be mixing those up as much as possible. And you know, do things differently. You need to think differently. Have those bigger plans. Rank your fields. Where do you have the issues? Know which weeds are there. Understand that biology. You have to find herbicides that are effective. And if there aren't any, you need to be doing something else. What can we do non-chemical to manage the seed bank to take out those weeds? Again, systems, got to spend more time planning and thinking how we can manage this. I'm concerned, too, as we move into this, we have to be paying attention to some drift issues or some off-target movement. The key with conventional, again, get yourself identified on our drift watch. 
be marked as a conventional field. Again, the more that you, again, let folks know, I mean, as far as like, this is a conventional field, talk to your neighbors, again, the rules are in place, we just need to follow those as far as managing it, but it's going to be a challenge. It won't be so simple. We need to map those weeds. We need to change things. We want to keep our fence rows, our waterways clean, keep weeds from going to seed, mix it up as effective as we can. The prees are crucial. We need to have those effective prees using those full maximum rates, get that robust plan, dig out the iron, as I said, be using that, because um, herbicides aren't going to take care of this on their own. We've got to have full systems, and here's really the big thing. If you don't use a pre, don't call me, because we just, the options are very slim to clean up a problem. If you don't have a pre-emergence program in corn and beans, it becomes very challenging. More options in corn than in soybeans. Soybeans, it becomes very few to where you'll be happy. You will be frustrated with what you're dealing with on that. So with that, I guess I can take some questions for a bit. Yeah. 240. Well, that's, I kind of went by that fast because I know there's more discussions on that, but where? Where, where are you looking for it? You know, okay, so the, the systems that are coming to place in the beans, again, not conventional, but we've got our dicamba soybeans, which I know Ross is sitting here. That is now cleared. We've got, you know, the dicamba beans have been cleared as far as the beans themselves. We now got a label for uh, the extend as far as moving into that. So that's the dicamba. It's one of the growth regulators. We also have the 2,4-D systems, the Enlist Duo coming. So we've got you know, that herbicide is actually already has the label. We're waiting for the seed to have the label. So in soybeans, that's, that's our newest coming on board are the growth regulators, okay? Now, one thing Fritz and I have had an advantage, we've had an opportunity to evaluate the Enlist Duo or the 2,4-D systems in soybeans for quite a few years, just starting to look at the extend dicamba. But they aren't, you know, they are not new herbicide, so we've seen them in corn for a long time. Water hemp is, I'm a little nervous about that. The growth regulators, in my opinion, aren't as effective on water hemp for a number of reasons. They are very good on the giant ragweed, you know, when the giant ragweed, as far as controlling them. Remember, we're not, these products, you're spraying what's up. There's no residual, so anything that germinates later it's not going to clean up. You, clean, you take what's there, you need to hit them relatively small, like any other weed. Water hemp, just a different beast. It, it has, you know, those narrower weed, as far as its leaves, very many biotypes, it kind of looks different. And I'm not as impressed with how either of those control water hemp. And if it gets big, you know, it's even more difficult. It'll take some of it out, it's just not a complete control like what I've seen or what we've seen in our ratings for giant ragweed. The other issue is water hemp emerges over this big window. So there's no residual there. So it's going to keep coming. Where ragweed kind of ends, the water hemp keeps coming. It's not going to give you anything for later. So it's not a sole program by any means. You still need something there that's going to carry you for the season. So that's just our experience with it as we've evaluated is it is not, you know, the, the growth regulators, the dicamba, the 2,4-D, not as effective on water hemp as they are on the giant ragweed. And I said, that's our experience over in Rochester. Ross may have some other experience in different parts of the state, you know, but I'm just a little, you know, got to hit it at the right time, got to hit it early. Can't be the only thing that you're going to do. You need to be planning something else along with that. Because you specifically said water hemp, right? Yeah. What would you recommend in conventional corn for a grass herbicide? I've been putting down Pure Start, but in, not the, in the coming back with Caprino, but right. I'm getting a woolly cup grass. Right. And that was part of where I said specifically that's the issue. Okay, the thing with Sure Start, which again, has been a good foundation, but it has lower rates of the three products that are in it. You have a lower rate. So this is where, like the Resicor coming in with that, again, have full labeled rates in there. 
the Acuron, the Acuron Flexi, higher labeled rates, but it seems like the Resicor and the Woolly Cupgrass side with having the Acetochlor in there, which is similar to the Sure Start, but the Resicor has the higher rate in there. So carrying you longer and doing a better job. So I think, again, starting with maybe a more robust pre, it's gonna be a little more money, but if Woolly Cup is your problem, I mean, and that's one of them, you need to really get as the best down, where the Acuron has the dual, the Resicor has the Acetochlor, or the harness, as we would know. It seems to do a better job carrying you in there. When you come to the post program, we don't, if you're getting escapes in there and, and you see something, Accent Q becomes one of the players, but you gotta get it on small, you know, small. That's one that, you know, could be, it's probably one of our better ones to come on. There your Caprino could come back again. The Lotus is in Caprino. Sometimes adding a little atrazine if you can handle the atrazine in there, okay? Can be uh, synergistic and help with that. But I'd, I'd back up on my pre and I'd go, probably the Resicor is a better option for you there. So that, that would be my suggestion. And we, honestly, we were just over in a meeting with West, um, Wisconsin, who's dealing with some of that too, and that was their experience as well, that they thought that the Resicor was a better player when you're dealing with the woolly cup grass, okay? Okay. Right. Oh, okay. That's a good question. So he was asking about that delayed planting on the soybeans and how it impacts yield. And that, that is a concern. That's definitely one of those, you know, okay, how am I going to trade this off? So, you know, when we, the curve, which um, Jared has done, you know, we've had that map. It, it's very, very um, limited as far as uh, the impact on yield on the front end. So if we were to go out to May 20th, your loss in yield, mm, marginal. When you start to get into June, we can see that a bigger you know, drop. But I think that May 20th, May 22nd, 3rd in there is kind of a nice sweet spot because you're taking out a very good big flush of ragweed. You maybe pay a little here, but that's huge. That's, that's one cost of a herbicide program by taking that big flush out and having less ragweed. And this program is really, that is, we're really talking about a ragweed or those early season, lamb's quarters is earlier, taking those earlier weeds out. Still need to think about your water hemp program, but that's where like the dual, the outlook, you know, can help you there. Because I'd still go with my pre. I'm just planning later, get my pre on and then watch my season. But it's, it's just, you know, again, finding kind of a, a happy play. <laughs> but that was sort of the, the time frame is get into that second half of May, a window in there, you know, weather's perfect, everything will go right. But that is where your tillage can help you on that front end. And you don't, it may not be just one pass. You know, if you let those ragweed really get too big, you know, you, 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 know, you need to stay on top of it. But the tillage is really helping you because now you're not throwing a herbicide at it again. You're using the non-chemical. And again, it, it seems like you can find a balance in there. Plus I'd prioritize my field. Where do I have, you know, which ones are the ones that I could maybe delay? Maybe you don't have to do that on every single field. You only have such a window. So which, you know, prioritize. Where's giant ragweed my worst problem? And if it is a really terrible problem, maybe I need to have corn a second year in there because I need to drive that population down and get it somewhat under control before I jump into beans. So a couple ways to think at it. But that's, that's a good, very good question and a fair question, but we have to add other things to the, to the plate. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Let's Thank you. Yeah, I think you pull me off when you needed to.